Well, good morning, everyone. I think we might make a start. I'm um, Martin Green. I'm director of ACAP. And first thing I'd like to do is welcome you all here to the University of New South Wales. Particular welcome to those that have come from uh, interstate, our arena representatives, um, representatives from industry, and uh, all of you could, that could make it. I'm going to start off proceedings by giving a bit of an introductory talk, recent developments in photovoltaics and uh, ACAP's role. So we've got a, a program uh, organised over the next couple of days that I think is going to be very exciting and I'm really looking forward to um, I'm also a director of the UNSW node of ACAP and I'd just like to congratulate one of the other node directors, Professor Andrew Holmes, who's recently been elected president of the Australian Academy of Science. So that's a huge, huge honour and a very responsible job. Okay, recent developments in photovoltaics. Um, I'm sure as most in this room would know, um, there's been a rapid increase in the amount of photovoltaics deployed over the last few years. So this, this chart here just shows the annual capacity um, installed worldwide of different power generation sources and coal at the black back is still the predominant source unfortunately. Um, but the renewables in the form of wind and photovoltaics in particular have recently surged on in recent years. So last year in fact photovoltaics was the third largest source of new electricity generation internationally behind coal and wind. Just ahead of hydro and um, and gas. However, if we look a little bit further in the future, you know, I think most people in this room would, would have recognised for a while that photovoltaics had a big future, but many more people are now coming to that point of view. So this is a Bloomberg um, projection about how the new capacity might increase over the coming decade or two. So um, uh, photovoltaics is the two uh, yellow colours at the top and wind is the blue one beneath. And, you know, what Bloomberg are projecting is a steady decline in the amount of fossil fuel capacity that's installed internationally, increasing amount of photovoltaics and wind. So photovoltaics will move from number three position to number two, and that could be as early as next year, and then eventually become the predominant source of new electricity generation. So I think we're on the, the verge of an energy revolution in the way that we um, actually generate our electricity and um, in the longer term, our, our energy. So uh, you know, not only Bloomberg shared this view, but this is a survey of the global power and utilities industry that was recently released. So these are the um, issues, the technological issues that they I think are most likely to impact power distribution, generation distribution over the coming decades. And um, the red ones here are the ones I think are important. So photovoltaic, uh, well, solar energy, the rapid decline in the price of solar panels is one of the things that was identified that's going to have most impact upon the power industry over the coming decades. And these other ones are things that go along with that, like improved energy efficiency, smart grids and so on. So um, I, I guess that's a, becoming more of a universal picture. There's a big future for photovoltaics. How far might the technology go? This is a study I like quoting from the German Advisory Council on Global Change. Most of the work was done around the year 2000, so published in 2003, but it was a very bold projection when you consider the previous graph and how little photovoltaics was actually installed at that date. But they projected energy demand, that's um, exajoules per annum up in this direction, primary energy demand over the coming century. And our demand is at least likely to, it's likely to at least quadruple over this century. So that's a, regarded as quite a conservative estimate as the world um, rises to the living standards of the Western countries. At the moment, we're very heavily dependent on the fossil fuels, gas, coal and oil, um, but that's something that we can't continue to do quite obviously. So this study I think was quite realistic in anticipating our dependence on these sources was going to increase, but slowly wind them in by uptake of more sustainable sources, biomass, wind and solar. But by the turn of the century, they anticipate about a quarter of our primary energy. This is not electricity, but primary energy could be supplied by solar electricity. And then by the end of the decade, the vast majority, um, 64%. Welcome for our Queensland delegates. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> on that previous graph, you know, we're pretty early days for these technologies, but if you, if you have a look at um, on a logarithmic scale, what's been happening, this is installed capacity here, the figures that were in that previous graph, but plotted on a logarithmic scale, they're the red line shown here. And the, the green um, symbols here represent the, represent the um, actual progress with the different technologies. So that, that study uh, attempted to be realistic and putting constraints on what you could do with the different technologies. And for the emerging ones like wind and photovoltaics, that constraint was how quickly an industry could grow. So a 10 time growth in a size of an industry per decade was regarded as a realistic constraint on what could be achieved. So you can see wind is pretty much sticking to the plot. So it's been growing 10 times a decade in terms of the amount of wind that's been installed. But photovoltaics have sort of gone berserk. It's um, well ahead of that 10 times per decade growth as you can see there. In fact, by the end of this year, we will have reached the um, anticipated installed capacity for 2020. So 13 years into the program, sort of seven years ahead of schedule. But if we can keep to the left of this um, red line here, we can reach what might have seemed like quite a optimistic uh, projection from that earlier study of 25% of the world's primary energy by 2050. Um, Germany has spearheaded this uh, transition to wind and photovoltaics through their feed-in tariffs program, mm -hmm. much maligned feed-in tariffs program. But um, I think the uh, situation with the German grid is how many grids around the world will look by 2020. So this is showing the demand upon the German grid this most recent August. So 60 gigawatts at the top there. And um, this is days of the month of August. So you can see this cyclic um, de increase, cyclic behavior of the demand for electricity. The yellow bits at the top there is photovoltaics. And I think the German experience with photovoltaics has been very positive and that'll help accelerate the acceptance of photovoltaics by other utilities worldwide when this um, very beneficial um, performance of photovoltaics is more widely known. So photovoltaics has been ideal in flattening out the load that the traditional generators have to supply where they can operate more efficiently and as a result the wholesale price of electricity within Germany has dropped very dramatically as a result of the sort of load levelling for the remainder of the plant that the photovoltaics has been able to provide by being so well matched to peak demand. But I think this is many countries around the world will have a grid profile that looks pretty similar to this by, um, by 2020. Okay, well, that's a, a brief um, overview of what's been happening in terms of market. What's been driving the rapid growth of photovoltaics or at least is likely to drive the ongoing growth of the photovoltaics market is decreasing prices and probably more importantly, decreasing costs. So the decreasing prices has been a result of oversupply in the market but manufacturers have had to respond by um, taking the costs out of their product. Uh, this is just a graph showing manu manufacturing costs reported by the different manufacturers over recent quarters. So these are just the ticker codes, the stock market codes of the companies involved. But um, uh, the PV industries, I'm sure many would be aware, has a roadmap now. And this roadmap, the second edition in March, projected a steady decline in the price, well, the manufacturing cost, to be more specific, of photovoltaics over this decade. But again, the industry has far outperformed that with the cost reducing very dramatically. So already we're um, below the types of costs, again, that were projected for 2020. So seven years ahead of the timeline that was projected only a year or two ago. Um, so this, this um, price decrease has been driven by the um, this cost decrease has been driven by the price decrease due to the oversupply. Um, some manufacturers are now reporting manufacturing costs at 50 cents per watt, as you can see here. One very important thing happened over the last year or so. The, by far the cheapest technology to manufacture used to be a thin film um, technology manufactured by First Solar that you can see here. So they're by far the lowest cost manufacturer of thin film product and by far the lowest cost of uh, all manufacturers just a couple of years ago. So a huge margin in manufacturing cost relative to the rest. But with a rapid um, decrease in the silicon prices, the, um, that situation has now been overturned and uh, silicon manufacturers can now manufacture more cheaply than the, um, than the thin film, uh, leading thin film manufacturer. 
Part of it's due to encapsulation costs. So um, silicon is basically a very rugged material, so it needs less encapsulation than some of these other thin film materials. And um, the decreased of lower efficiency of the thin films drives you towards higher encapsulation costs. In the case of First Solar, the steady reductions that you can see there have come about almost entirely through improved efficiency. I think this is very important to our program. Um, so the, the cost per unit area of the product has stayed pretty much the same. It's just been the improved power output you get from that cost investment that's driven down their costs here. Um, but, uh, and, and more of those are anticipated as they are with the silicon technology, which will, uh, it's anticipated to result in further cost reductions to perhaps as low as 36 cents a watt by 2017. Be similar reductions in the thin films, particularly this technology uh, due to increased efficiency. However, you're still the wrong side of the silicon line if you're working on this uh, particular technology. If you could somehow double the cost, double the efficiency of the thin film technology, you'd end up on the right side as shown here. So I think that's a really important conclusion from this. If you can keep your you're limited in how low you can get your aerial costs. If you can increase the efficiency, um, that's the key to getting low cost per watt. However, if you can uh, do the same with silicon, if you can find a way of doubling the efficiency of silicon, you again end up very low cost. And this has some impact on the programs that we're taking, we're investigating here under the ACAP program at UNSW. Well, moving on to uh, ACAP's role, just a little bit about the history of ACAP. Um, it's had its genesis in uh, 2010, when President Obama was supposed to um, visit Australia on a couple of occasions, and actually a visit to our laboratories here was part of that planned visit. Uh, however, um, he didn't make it to Australia during that year, but Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton did, and met with then our then Prime Minister Julia Gillard in November. And this, the opportunity was taken to make an announcement about um, solar energy that had been prepared for President Obama's visit. But um, uh, um, it was announced a joint solar power research program in a, in a bid to drive down the cost of the technology. The interesting thing about um, this announcement was the Australian government had been well prepared for it and they had already secured an allocation of funds to support it but the US government hadn't been prepared for it. And at, as at present, there have been no funds, as far as I'm aware, allocated to the program. However, um, this uh, announcement resulted in a very specific outcome that's important to us. Um, the, uh, the call for proposals for strategic research initiatives, which the ACAP Centre represents, was called for and uh, 33 million was allocated for the um, ACAP over a, a uh, eight year period. Um, the interesting thing about our bid for this centre was that it had to be based on US-Australian collaboration, even though there was no US funds invested into the uh, initiative. So that very much determined the structure that we proposed for our centre. So ACAP is, perhaps, is, is a junior centre in a, in a um, broader centre known as Aussie APV, the Australian US Institute for Advanced Photovoltaics. You can see the logos there, so we've sort of echoed the ACAP logo in the, in the Aussie APV, and as the logo suggests, it involves collaboration between Australia and the US. Um, so this is the uh, overarching uh, centre, Australian US Institute for Advanced Photovoltaics. It has an internationally advisory committee that coordinates the activities of that overarching centre. But to provide a balance between the US and Australian programs, even though there was no extra additional US funds being invested, we teamed up with a newly, um, a centre that had been newly created in the US at Arizona State, State University, Quest, um, quantum solar computer that had very similar objectives to what we're seeking within ACAP. So that provided sort of this international balance which forms part of our program. We also have formal US partners, NREL and uh, the other universities that are listed here, but um, universities and other laboratories that are listed here. But, um, I guess our general scope is to collaborate with the US because the ACAP activities are a subset of this larger Aussie APV centre. 
So ACAP sits in its parallel universe, uh, parallel to the um, to US activities with Quest as the lead agency there. Um, and um, we, as you most be aware, we involve um, uh, six institutes, six Australian institutes and some industrial partners. And we have five programs that you can see outlined down here. So we have, we're really involved, ACAP we're really involved in two centres. There's the Aussie APB and ACAP, and we have five um, programs, PP1 to PP5 that are indicated there. I'll talk a little bit about those later. I'll um, talk about some of the activities under the uh, Aussie APV banner later on the day when I get to talk about the USNW node activities, but we do have a website established and that'll be the vehicle for um, promoting um, the, the achievements under that uh, joint program. But in terms of the ACAP um, centre, it, it, it uh, operates more or less as a discrete entity with its own steering committee and management committee. So we, we have a parallel centre to the to the US-based uh, centres, with the activities between the two parallel universes coordinated by the, the uh, International Advisory Committee of Aussie APV. So these are the five programs that I mentioned. So silicon cells, and that involves primarily UNSW and uh, ANU, um, where we've got various objectives in terms of improving, the, basically where all of them are targeting the cost of the silicon photovoltaic product. The second program involves a wide range of activities with thin film cells. So that involves a wider grouping of, um, of uh, ACAP partners in, tr in looking at um, organic solar cells in particular, but also um, earth abundant thin films in general. So CZTS is another one that we're looking at and uh, silicon thin films as well, as well as a range of uh, third generation approaches pushing the idea of high efficiency being the key to low cost. PP3 um, involves optics and characterization with these three um, nodes here particularly involved in this activity. So um, I think this provides an area where there's a lot of scope for interaction between the different nodes. So I think we can learn from each other. Um, no, techniques that are used in one branch of photovoltaics might not be well known to the other branches. So I think this is an activity where we can seek some very valuable cross fertilization. And then um, manufacturing issues is the fourth strand where we look at issues involved in the manufacturing of the, uh, of the photovoltaics and the costing of the different technologies and issues can, can be addressed in trying to reduce the cost. UNSW and CSRO are most involved in those activities. And then the final strand, very important one, education, training and outreach and all of the partners are involved in that activity there. We're very milestone driven, so the whole program is driven by these milestones. So the contract that we've signed with ASI that's been now been transferred to ARENA allows us to get paid if we achieve these milestones. Um, so we have um, milestones that become increasingly aggressive. You know, just um, echoing that former idea, efficiency is a way to take the cost out of photovoltaics. So with the silicon area, we have quite specific milestones for a range of different approaches for reducing the cost of silicon photovoltaics. And our cost uh, targets echo those of the uh, US Sunshot program. So that's quite, a, um, quite an ambitious program established by the US Department of Energy, you know, targeting a, a big initiative to drive down the cost of photovoltaics, similar to the Moonshot program in the, in the 60s. But um, these are the targets that are being sought within the Sunshot program, and we're echoing those targets within our program. So ending up at costs at the end of the program that are competitive with um, those expected from um, any traditional source of electricity generation. Um, similarly for the thin film program, PPB2, we have um, chasing ever increasing efficiency. And then um, targets in terms of um, uh, the number of evaluations we do of technology and then normal academic targets in terms of publications, numbers of students trained and so on, as indicated here. So these, it's very important that we get these milestones because that um, ensures that we get paid for the work that we've done. 
The other important thing um, that forms part of our agreement under which ACAP's established is that we're due to have a review um, no later than 30th September 2015. So that's the, that's the latest date. So, you know, perhaps sometime early in 2015. So if you think about it, the, the results and finances and everything, we're going to be able to report them uh, are going to be those from 2014, i.e. next year. So next year is going to be a very important year in putting our best foot forward and, and um, showing the progress that we've been able to make towards the milestones that we've established. So this year has been more or less a foundation year. We've sorted out the administrative and establishment issues involved in setting up a new centre like ACAP, which is quite complex when you've got six different nodes involved. But um, next year, really important that we make good progress, um, will continue to make good progress in our milestone. One thing that featured very strongly in the formation of ACAP was that we were encouraged to collaborate. So you'll see that there's many um, uh, collaborative type interactions that are going to be assessed during this review. So the interaction, collaboration with each other, with each other and our industrial partners, um, that, that's those two there. So we need to find ways of uh, synergistically building on what each other are doing to, um, to uh, achieve the um, objectives that are going to be important for this review. Um, knowledge sharing activities, important. Knowledge sharing and dissemination. Uh, so this is the type of thing that particularly are going to be important as well as us doing well in achieving our overall goal of reducing the price or the cost of photovoltaics. Okay, well that's finishes my brief introduction. Um, we have what I hope is a very interesting program outline. This is what's scheduled for today. So we're going to have a presentation by Arena, given by um, Veronica Hurd as our next talk. And then we're going to take a break for coffee and give everyone a chance to mingle. One of the ideas behind this conference is give people plenty of opportunity for interacting, particularly people between the you know, coming from the different nodes. So we want you to do that. So coffee break is one of the occasions that you'll get to, to do that. So please mingle, make yourself known to people that you have not met before. Um, after the coffee break, we'll have a um, series of lectures from the different node directors, very short, only 15 minutes, but that'll just give a nutshell presentation on what the different nodes are up to. Um, then we'll have lunch, your own arrangements, while you're on lunch, we'll be having our management committee meeting. Um, we've got a tour organised uh, straight after lunch. So if you're interested in participating in the tour of this building, um, uh, which includes a, a large solar array on the, on the roof up here, um, please let the leg registration desk know, perhaps during the coffee break or, or sometime um, um, during lunch. Um, so we've got an idea of the numbers that want to do that. And then in the afternoon, we have our poster session. So there's 30 odd posters that should be up there by then. And um, we've asked the node directors to select the uh, material that select the um, areas of activity that's presented in, the, you know, in those projects. So they'll give a good cross section of the range of activities happening between the, happening at the different nodes, you know, at the detailed technical level. So again, we're hoping for plenty of interaction during that poster session. There'll be coffee served in that post area later in the afternoon, and then we cap the day off with a reception upstairs in the in the um, bar Novitas upstairs, and then your own arrangements for dinner. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for your attention. That brings me to the end of my presentation. So I'd like to um, introduce uh, Veronica Hurd from Arena. Uh, for those that may not know Veronica, I also introduce Richard Corkish, who you, some might not know, but um, Dr. Richard Corkish is the Chief Operating Officer of ACAP, so he has, um, he's formerly head of the School of Photovoltaic uh, and Renewable Energy Engineering here at the university, um, but um, uh, Richard has uh, responsibility for the operation of uh, the ACAP node. And Joyce Ho, who may not be in the room, I can't see it, but she's, um, she's taken a big role. She's the ACAP Administration Officer and she's played a big role in setting up all the infrastructure that you'll see supporting our activities today. So thank you for your attention and Veronica will give us a now talk on arena activities.